Welcome everybody, I'm Sally Sexton and welcome to Student Supports, a panel presentation with Georgia Tech's Excel program. The intended outcome for today's learning community event is to gain insight about student supports, coaching and mentoring from multiple perspectives and to learn directly from those receiving and providing supports. We have guiding questions for each panelist today to facilitate hearing about their individual perspectives. We welcome questions from our community during this discussion, but we ask that you please post them in chat or wait until the Q&A at the end. We will be watching for our questions in the your questions in the chat box. We will begin today with Luke Roman, the Mentorship Program Coordinator at Georgia Tech Excel. He will introduce himself and our panelists today. Welcome, Luke. Yeah, thanks, Sally. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with y'all and uh, looking forward to kind of going over the Excel program and um, our mentorship program, and I hope you find it helpful. Um, but yeah, if you want to move on to the next slide, Sally. So yeah, so just to go over kind of the people that are going to be representing Excel um, today, we have myself, the uh, mentorship program coordinator. Um, I've been here since in, at Excel since um, 2017. Um, so I've been a part of the program for essentially the whole time. Um, uh, th we were around for a few t few years before I started, but um, it's been a privilege to kind of watch it grow, and I hope you know, the insight will be helpful for any of y'all that are starting programs or, or currently have one. Um, and then also we have uh, Martha Haythorn, who's on the call. She's a second year Excel student. Um, and she's also host of Mondays with Martha, um, which is a vlog that you can find on YouTube where she um, uh, interviews different different um, advocates and di just different stakeholders within the disability community. And it, it's really, really good. So I highly recommend that. And that'll be sent out um, in a follow-up email um, after today's presentation. Um, we also have Hannah Shaw joining us, who's a third year Georgia Tech student. Um, she's currently a coach within the Excel Mentorship Program, um, but she's held a variety of roles within the program. And she's also outreach chair on Excel Student Advisory Board, which is a collection of students um, and mentors that help with a variety of different things like events, recruitment, um, uh, outreach, um, sport, like intramurals, a lot of different things like that. Um, then we also have Preston Tauscher. Um, he's a parent of a 2021 graduate of the Excel program. So. Um, we invited him to join us because he really has seen the program from start to start to finish and really can touch on um, just multiple aspects, especially the transition out of college, which I think is equally as important as the transition in. Um, and then finally, we have um, the Ken Surden, who's the di director of Excel, of Excel, and he's been um, director since the very beginning, um, and we'll also be able to provide a lot of insightful information. Um, and as, as Sally mentioned previously, um, we'll definitely be sticking around for a few minutes after the presentation, but if for some reason you, uh, you have further questions or if, you know, something comes up maybe tonight or tomorrow or whenever, um, my email's here and it'll also be provided um, in any follow-up emails that y'all may receive. Cool. So just to kind of give you all just a quick overview about Georgia Tech, um, we're a 400 acre campus in the middle or in Midtown Atlanta. Um, and it, we really are like right in the middle of Atlanta, but the campus, you really, they've done such a fabulous job and you really feel like you're in a college town almost when you're um, at Georgia Tech's campus. Um, it's the 10th best public university, according to the 2020. 2022 U.S. News and World Report. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is just because it's, it's just awesome that a program with that much prestige or a university with that much prestige would would allow a program like ours to exist. And, you know, it's just really it, it adds a lot of different elements to the peer support program that we'll be discussing. And um, and yeah, I, I just think it's a privilege to be here. Um, and then we are a STEM and technology research. We have a STEM and technology research focus. However, the Excel program itself, you know, students come for a, 
you don't necessarily have to have like a STEM interest, which means science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, we, we have students from a variety of different backgrounds. However, I do mention that as well because the mentors that, that work with us typically aren't necessarily pursuing a career within the disability field or in education, social work, psychiatry, anything like that. They're, they're going on to be engineers and um, business leaders and um, just a variety of different, you know, we have astronauts that have graduated from Georgia Tech. So it, it, it does have a, a, creates an element that's a little different than other programs with the mentorship side of things because of that dynamic. Um, and we have a very diverse student body coming with with represent or with students from all over the uh, all over the world that come to Georgia Tech. Go to the next slide. So to give a quick overview of Excel, as I mentioned, we've been around since 2015, and we have two separate certificates students receive. The first certificate is in academic enrichment, social fluency, and career exploration. Um, and in years three and four, we kind of shift that um, focus to social growth, leadership, and career development. So those first few, first two years, we're really trying to get the students used to being on campus, used to going to class. They start with some different internships through in the starting their second semester of their first year, um, and just trying out a bunch of different careers and just trying to find their place on campus and find their friend groups and find you know, what, you know, kind of what it's like to be independent and away from your parents. Um, and then in years three and four, now that you've kind of have that foundation, we really shift towards like the leadership side of things and really developing the career um, interests that you might have. And the students starting their third year start interning off campus. So during the first two years, you're just working four, six, eight hours a week somewhere on campus. And then um, in years three and four, we're really trying to get you to where by the time you graduate, um, you're working, you know, at least part time. Um, so that transition out is as smooth as possible. Currently, we have 31 students. Our capacity is probably around 40 students. We kind of fluctuate in COVID and that dynamic kind of has slowed things down like I think it has with a lot of different industries over the last year or so. Um, but we have eight faculty and staff, um, which consists of three career advisors. So we have a really big focus on careers because that's why anyone goes to college, right, is to get a better job than they otherwise would have had. Um, but we also have two academic coordinators that um, do have multiple aspects to their job. They, they teach our Excel fundamental classes, which are classes like financial literacy, um, a technology class, a health and wellness class, classes that are really focused on the needs of the Excel students. And they also work with Georgia Tech professors in what we call inclusive classes, which are traditional Georgia Tech classes alongside uh, degree-seeking Georgia Tech students that typically we have maybe one or two Excel students in a class, and they work with the professors to modify uh, assignments, modify um, tests, and all that kind of good stuff. So it's still challenging the student, but, you know, we are at a very difficult university where degree-seeking students really struggle to, to pass. So um, we're very cogniz cognizant of that and have developed some good relationships throughout the academic side of things at Georgia Tech. And then there's me who is on kind of the um, the social and lead or social and independent living side of things. So I manage about 80 um, mentors and coaches that work with students predominantly on social skills and independent living skills that I'll touch on um, in a few minutes. Um, so currently we have 31 coaches and I'll kind of discuss the difference between the coach and mentor side of things. We have 75 um, academic or what we also call tutors and general mentors. Um, typically our tutors come that are for in the inclusive classes come from the particular class um, that the students in. That way they're really getting an understanding of, you know, they'll do some note taking, they'll do, um, they'll, they just really kind of know what's going on within the class. Um, with like on the other side, I guess, like someone who's previously taken the class might not have that kind of understanding um, despite knowing the information. Um, the vast majority of our students live on campus in dorms. We have 
19 students currently living in Georgia Tech housing um, alongside the rest of Georgia Tech students. And then we have 10 students who live in off-campus housing, which is essentially on-campus housing, like it's student, li uh, student living, but it's just off-campus private housing um, that's honestly a little nicer than the dorms. Um, and then right now we have two students commuting with, with COVID and just different, for various reasons that, that that was the case. Typically we recommend that students do live on campus just because that's really where a lot of the growth comes from, um, you know, that you'll see over the four years of the program. Um, next slide. So as I kind of mentioned, the four pillars of Excel, we really focus on academic enrichment, career exploration, independent living, and social growth. So by the, we really feel that, you know, with the ex, getting the opportunity to really explore different careers, ex, explore your strengths and, and using your academics and uh, your mentors and the independent living and social growth to help you learn not only the soft skills to be employable, but also to live as independently as possible is our ultimate focus. Um, so yeah, next slide. So the EMP coaching roles. So coaches, co coaches, I always call coaches, like if the student's a CEO, the coach is the COO. So the chief operating officer where they're really in charge of, they're really the students go to support. Typically coaches have worked as a mentor previously with the students. So they've kind of developed that relationship, but they're kind of the team leader of the mentors that are also working with that student and have kind of just kind of know what strategies may work with the student, what strategies may not. Um, it's about a three to five hour a week commitment and they do um, this is a lot of the logistics. So they'll make sure, um, you know, say the student needs to learn um, is, is struggling, like their parents reached out and they spent too much. So maybe they'll say, hey, to one of the mentors, do you mind focusing more on budgeting for the next couple of weeks? And let's get that under control. Um, maybe we'll do some meal planning or grocery shopping or something to help with that. Um, then they'll do like things like scheduling. So it's like you have all these social activities that you want to do this week, various clubs, maybe some hangouts with friends. Um, but how are we going to make sure you're managing your time that you're still completing your schoolwork and your internship hours and all your other expectations, but still, you know, maintaining the social aspect of your life. They'll help students create to-do lists of assignments they have during that week, or just to-do lists of various things. Maybe it's just to-do lists of, you know, just staying organized around the apartment or chores or, you know, whatever it might be that will, that really we find helpful with a lot of the executive functioning um, skills of the students that that we are really focused on trying to improve over the course of the four years. Um, they they assist students in goal progression and and provide additional support as necessary. So, um, the both the mentors and the coaches were really a goal oriented program where the students set goals. Um, at the beginning of each semester, and and sometimes it's with the coach or with the coaches. Um, feedback based on kind of working with them previously or and I'll kind of talk about how we kind of set those goals in a few minutes but um, that, that's really kind of how we structure each semester for both mentors and um, coaches and to be a coach you have to have two years of experience within the mentorship program um, and I will say that we do pay some of our uh, coaches that like we prefer not to pay because we want people to join the Excel program like with pure intentions. But for some roles, we do have expectations that, you know, we really think that they're time consuming and really, um, you know, it, it's the right thing to do to, to compensate them. Um, so that is one thing that we do that y'all might find um, interesting. Um, and then in addition to coaches, essentially the same thing, but we have peers coaches. So I'll, I can talk a little bit more about peers towards the end of this, but peers is an evidence-based social skills curriculum based out of UCLA um, that really helps students improve their social skills um, with giving step-by-step -step instruction, starting at like trading information to find common interests with a, with a friend, entering group conversations, um, hosting a get together or um, attending a get together, entering a group conversation or 
um, dating or all the way to conflict resolution, uh, how to handle bullying, but giving, giving these step-by-step -step instructions. And the peers coaches, their role is to help do different role plays with the students throughout the week um, and, and really help with just kind of the social side of things. And, we, and this is for first year students. Um, because the way we, we use this peers curriculum for all first year students in their first semester, and it's really to give them a tool belt that'll help them be successful, to make friends, to gain confidence socially, um, so they can be successful and feel comfortable with, with going and trying new things throughout the four years um, of the program. And, and we found that super helpful instead of saying, oh, your goal is to make friends, well, just go to a club. It really gives them a better understanding of things. Um, Mentors are, a lit, so the mentors are usually kind of just new mentors or people or, or people who just applied to be mentors, you know, kind of new to the program. Maybe they've never worked with someone with disabilities previously, um, but they're typically focused um, on a specific skill. So we'll have like health and wellness mentors that help with cooking, grocery shopping, um, meal planning or meal prepping. Um, all the way to uh, working out, like coming up with the fitness routine or, you know, finding classes like Zumba or yoga or something just to make sure students are getting into healthy habits while they're here. Um, we'll have people that are doing more just general, general mentorship, which might be more aligned with, um, you know, things like, I don't know, like transportation, if that's a big thing. Like, so the student needs to learn about uh, ride sharing like Uber or Lyft, or maybe it's they're trying to get their learner's permit. Um, so helping them study for the tests, or maybe it's budgeting or a variety of different things um, where it's just kind of specific towards that role. However, the coaches do kind of assist and provide additional support in a lot of these areas as needed. Um, and then we have social mentors that are really kind of a continuation of the peers coaches. So they're really helping the students, you know, get engaged in clubs. So finding out where the clubs are, maybe role playing some conversations or figuring out some topics of conversation for when they're going to a club and, and meeting new people um, and kind of being their hype person of like, oh man, you can do this. And, you know, like I, I, everyone gets nervous when they go to a club for the first time. It's not anything new um, and nothing to be ashamed of and really kind of just boosting that self-confidence to help the students feel more comfortable, especially when it comes to getting integrated with uh, degree-seeking Georgia Tech students who may not be totally aware of the Excel program. Um, so they help with a lot of that. Next so slide. Luke, yeah. um, because we have a limited time frame, you probably don't realize oh. you used up your 15 minutes Did already. I, I knew this would happen. <laughs> I knew. <laughs> so we, um, I don't know if there's something you want to really capture, but I want to make sure we have time for each of our panelists and um, we will be able to share the, you know, your other slides with everybody. Um, but so maybe after from four to four fifteen, um, we and if more people stay back, we can go through some of your specific information about recruitment and um, academic and job support. Perfect. Well, sorry, I was long worded. Um, no, that's just fine. <laughs> yeah. So I'm more than happy to go over that. We'll send out this PowerPoint with, yeah. with more context afterwards. So yeah. So next up is is Martha Haythorn, who's the second year student who will give kind of her. Um, uh, just, um, just give you some information about the student side of things. And thank you so much, Luke. Next, we're gonna welcome Martha and we are going to give about five minutes for each of our panelist participants. Uh, and so Martha, I'm trying to find you in my screen. You're I'm here, right here and you're unmuted, great. Um, welcome and thank you so much for giving up your time today to be with us. I have a few questions for you. Um, and my first question is, what has been the best and the most challenging part of college? And if you also want to give a, us a little description of where you are right now, that would also help us. So right now, I'm a sophomore here at Georgia Tech in the Excel program. And um, something that feels challenging still is uh, is the transportation and making healthy choices. Um, transportation because I can't drive. I have the needs where I don't really have that skill 
to be able to drive. So I usually need help with the transportation. And as for the making healthy choices, there's a lot of restaurants and this is a tech and then there's a tech campus, which is great, but at the same time, it can be hard to make those healthy choices and having to stay within a healthy budget. So I'm learning how to do the grocery shopping by myself. And I'm also learning how to make um, healthy decisions. Like when I go out, like for an example, there's a restaurant here called Firehouse and I stopped there for lunch today. And so they asked me, write or eat bread? And so I know how I had to write better. So I said, wheat, because that is how I get whole grains. So it's easier than putting all that white cholesterol into my body. Thank you. And for the best part of being here at this tech is the academics. Um, I run my classes. So I'm taking into the psychology, into the sociology. I'm also taking a few Excel based classes career success and financial literacy, which has to do with money. Not an easy subject, but it's a very necessary subject. So I can understand the basics of money. And it is really informational and I am learning a lot from it. It's just not easy, but it's okay. Because it's a, it's a journey, but it's worth it. But I would say the best part is um, seeing how much work I can put into it and then seeing how much effort I get from my advisors, seeing those 90s of like, did I just do that? Wow, okay. Wow, I had the potential. It's a good feeling. Awesome, thank you so much. Could you share, Martha, an example of how a mentor or coach worked with you to help you accomplish one of your goals? Yeah, so a good example is, um, my mentor and my coach, um, one of the things that we work on it is grocery shopping. So when we go to Publix, the goal for me is to be able to, be able to find the items in the specific aisles by myself. And then um, the idea is to be able to go up and find the items and then to be able to pay for the items and understanding the payment rules around like how much it costs and how, when, when it's okay to tip and when it isn't okay to tip and um, learning the differences with money, um, that's one of the biggest ones right now. And um, another example is like understanding social cues. So if I'm out in public and I see someone who um, is cute or someone who um, I really want to talk to, but I um, kind of get um, excited and might not understand was appropriate to able to address that, which is good because even though it's hard to hear, it's necessary because sometimes you get a little bit too carried away, but they have to work on that and that's okay. Yeah, those are great examples. Um, could you give a few more examples of how you use mentors and coaches throughout your day? Yeah, so uh, throughout the day, like uh, with my social mentor, we go and exercise at the Campus Recreation Center here on campus by walking on the track. And we do like uh, attend social events together. We also, um, we work on social cues, as I said, and we also find other activities that interest me and really can help me be able to do with other peers. Um, my coach, I just, I cannot say enough about my coach. I just, I love her. She really, really pushes me on really working with my girls. Even though it feels hard and stressful, she always knows how to be optimistic and makes me feel so much better about it. Like, without her, I don't know, but I would be without her. I love her so much. What about academic support or tutors? Do you have anybody um, that helps you out during the day with your yes, classes? Yes, so right now I have two tutors, one for psychology and one for sociology. They do a great job kind of bringing in the whole class concept of what we're learning and to help me understand. They give me examples of things at my life saying, oh, so Martha, um, psychology-wise, Martha, what happens when you get stressed? And so they were just gonna say, but we're having to see get stressed. And they explained the parts of psychology 
and kind of see how it fits into my type of life. And in sociology, um, kind of understanding how people are communicating around me around social cues, making sure I'm understanding what's going on and making it clear on the whole picture. And I'm learning so much from that. Well, thank you so much, Martha, for answering those questions and telling us a little bit about your relationships with your mentors, your coaches, and your tutors. I love that. Uh, and now we get to actually hear from one of those mentors, Hannah Shaw. And Singh, he has some questions for Hannah. Yeah, thanks, Sally. Um, we have a few questions for Hannah. Uh, the first question okay. is, can you um, tell us what value has being a mentor had on your college experiences as a peer mentor? Yeah, so I'm not just saying this right now because I'm on this call. I'll say to anyone who asked me about the Excel program, but it has been the most enriching and rewarding part of my college experience so far. And the reason why I say that is because seeing another person overcome challenges and become more confident by doing so is just something that is so hard to put words on for how impactful it is. And being a mentor has really pushed me to take more responsibility more responsibility in my own life so that I can be an empathetic and um, and lead with integrity in my life so that I can just be a good role model for my students. Great. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. The next question, how have you seen students whom you have mentored or coached contribute to the com campus community? Do you have any examples for that? I do actually. So I would say an awesome thing about the Excel program is how goal oriented it is. And all of my um, students so far have been very passionate about getting involved on campus. Um, one of my students would go watch movies at CCF, which is a Christian organization on campus on Friday nights. And another one is actually a sous chef at a sorority right now because they love to work and be involved. And I would say that it's very easy um, for students to be able to find their place on campus and really get the most out of their college experience from that. Great. Um, do you have any examples where your support has faded over the course of time because it was no longer needed or needed less? Yes, yeah, so last year actually, I had a student who struggled with a lot of anxiety around her relationships. And so the majority of our meetings would be like me just being there as support for her and for her to like kind of talk out her feelings to me, to me and me providing her with advice. And um, there was just this one day after months and months of, of us just like talking through her thought process where a flip just like switched in her mind and it seemed like everything just started to make sense for her and all the mental challenges that she once faced just seemed to fade away like magic. And that was awesome to witness. But um, from that point on, we would just like meet as friends and just like talk about like random things that were going on in our lives and like what we were experiencing. And um, like, I guess, moving away from being goal oriented and just like hanging out as friends, which was awesome. Sounds great. Thanks for sharing your experiences and your perspectives. It, it is really, really helpful for us to understand. Okay. Well, thank um, you all have, for having me. Thanks. We have another panelist, uh, parent, and then Lise will ask some questions. Unmuted. Preston, I assume you're unmuted. And thank you I so much unmuted. for being here with us. It's so great to get a parent perspective. Um, first question is, can you share how the coordination of student supports allowed you to really trust that your, um, your student, um, your son had, um, that his support needs were addressed appropriately? Sure, but first, let me congratulate Luke, Martha, and Hannah on doing a phenomenal job. Yep. <laughs> you guys did wonderful. So that, Thank you. Yes. It's always great to see and hear. Um, so back to the question. And yes. let me preface that by saying I will probably have the same challenge as Luke. So just <laughs> remind me as we get closer to time. Okay. Um, but 
the one thing I do want to reinforce is you know, we let's just say we got the message nicely um, first semester with our son on campus that we need to let our kids explore and fail because that's mm-hmm. how they're going to learn. Um, and to be honest, first semester, we were just amazed at how much our son had grown from an independence perspective. They all definitely have their challenges and they all are unique and they need, they have special needs. Um, and when I say that, uh, my example is, you know, we found out through his first semester, he was having challenges making it to class on time. So we spoke with folks and got people just to, you know, help them with landmarks on campus. So this way it was more familiar because while tech is a very green campus, it is big and easy to get lost. Let's put it that way. Um, but the important thing is they find their way, you know, and they ask for help and they wound up figuring it out. So, you know, the lesson that we learned was we got to give them room to grow because um, otherwise they won't. So, you know, it was good. So next question. Nice. I, um, I, I was wondering how the Excel initiative prepared you with coordinating supports post-college. So that's a great question. Um, so Chase just finished in May. And to be honest, you know, that's part of the feedback that I'm working with the program on. Um, so their last year, they, the students work with the teachers on a transition plan. Um, and to be on, and to be honest, the feedback that I've given to Excel is I really think it's important going forward to incorporate the parents a little bit more. The goal really is for all of the kids to be completely independent, but the reality is the, it's going to be different for each situation. So, you know, I'm in good shape with my son, but it would have been great to have been a little bit more involved on the transition aspect of it. So this way, as they hand Chase back over to mom and dad, we at least have a better grasp on all of their goals and what are some of the opportunities and agencies that are available to them after graduation. Okay, that's nice. And then you kind of touched on this earlier was the um, lessons learned, just kind of allowing for failure and taking a step back. Yes, that yeah. is very, very important. And we, yeah. we were quite fortunate through Chase's four years at Tech where you know, his failures didn't cost anything. Mm-hmm. Um, like one example was he left his laptop in a class and he found his way back and it was still there. You know, in another situation where we were picking him up for um, the holidays one year and he had all of his clothes and really nice clothes ready to roll and decided to go to Yogli Mugly to get a yogurt and came back and one of the maintenance men in the off-campus apartment saw the stuff standing there. So he put it away and then left for the day and didn't tell anybody. So we were like, oh my gosh, you have no clothes. Yeah. <laughs> but goodness was, he learned the lesson where you can't do that stuff. Um, and it didn't cost us anything. And then yeah. just to kind of reiterate some of the points that Martha and, and Luke highlighted, you know, the coaches themselves really are fantastic. And, and we were truly fortunate through Chase's four years because he, they worked hard to find coaches that did have, you know, very much common interests. Um, so he really, uh, as Hannah had highlighted, he really became friends with them. Um, and even though he's done with the program, he's gotten in touch with some of his coaches. They're meeting for dinner, even though he's not in, in tech anymore. Um, Very nice. But they have really worked hard, you know, like from a meals perspective, that was probably one of his, his favorite coaching opportunities, mm-hmm. you know, just going out, doing the shopping prior to, you know, them cooking and stuff. And now like one of his favorites to cook is eggs in a hole. So, mm-hmm. you know, he's really advanced and it's, it's definitely 
pretty impressive. Um, nice. And then another thing where the coaches... Mm, have, I might have to cut you off just so we can get to the next person yeah. and then save that thought. And then hopefully we'll have time to share it in the very uh, last question and answer section. Well, thank you for, thank you. for gently reminding me of that. <laughs> and thank you so much. It's so great to hear from you. Um, Thanks. Happy and, to hear. Yeah. Now we'll go back to Sally. Yeah, thank you so much, Preston and Liz. And we do want to hear that last thought. So please hang around. Um, our, our last panelist is Ken Serden, the director of Excel. And we have a couple questions for you, Ken. And I'm looking for you now. There you are. Uh, can you describe how the person-centered planning process guides what supports a student needs? and how the support program or structure has changed and evolved over time based on student-centered needs? Yeah, um, initially when we were starting the program back in 2014, we were looking at different types of person-centered plan models. And um, the ones that I looked at were um, often aspirational. Uh, so there was uh, you know, a big sheet of paper that um, you know, had sort of the, all the large dreams that a person might have for their future. Um, but I didn't see much follow-up on, on that. And so from year to year, that sheet of paper could look pretty much the same, but you wouldn't necessarily see where, um, the goals have been worked on. So as we were designing what we thought we would want to do, uh, and that's been modified over the years, we tried to put goals within those person-centered plans. And so uh, initially in the first iteration, um, we tried to build in semester goals in terms of the different things that we uh, were working on in the program. So uh, if a student had a goal to work at the airport someday, well, um, you know, one goal might be calling and talking to some people at Delta and doing some informational interviews. Uh, the next semester, it might be doing an internship at the customer service desk at the airport. Uh, the following year, it, it might be um, getting forklift operation certificates so that you could work in a warehouse at the airport. So, you know, we were, that, and that's a real example of just one student, uh, for example. It could be social goals. Uh, it could be exploring clubs on campus uh, and, uh, you know, talking about how you went about exploring that club uh, and tying in self-advocacy into that. So did you do it on your own? Uh, did you ask one of your mentors to go with you the first time? But then after that, you said you got it and you were good with it. Did you go and you didn't like it? And what were the reasons you didn't like it? So that was really the first year we did it. Um, and then since then, it's just, um, it's been modified over time so that instead of doing two of those a year, we do uh, one of those a year for freshmen as they come in. Uh, there is a mid-year meeting to talk about how the goals have been worked on. And then there is an end of the year person-centered plan to follow up, uh, review all the work that's been done, and then plan for the next uh, year, including talking about things that could be done over the summer uh, to help you with those goals. So an example of that would be looking at your last internship and then um, looking at jobs that you get in the summer that would help build a certain set of skill sets in pursuit of a particular job or career. Thank you. Um, that's really related to my next question um, about just getting community engagement. Um, but can you describe how you're being intentional about planning for student supports in the community and engaging the family at a time so that following graduation, there's that transition that Preston was talking about? Yeah, sure. So um, it's about three years ago, uh, a former colleague of mine at the CDC uh, retired. He was the Associate uh, Director of uh, Science and Policy at the National Center on Birth Effects and Developmental Disabilities. Uh, he asked if we wanted any help with anything. And I said, yeah, sure, Mike, I would love to develop transition courses uh, that helped students plan for their exit from 
college and what's next. And so initially that was three courses that started their junior year and then carried over uh, into their senior year. Uh, That has since been condensed to two classes over the senior year. Um, And as part of that, we developed competencies to track seven different areas of transition that we um, we had that we were working with the students on in, in um, those courses. So things like transportation, uh, how are you going to get to and from work? Um, housing, where are you going to live? Are you going to continue to live in downtown Atlanta or uh, are you going to be moving back home? Um, um, work, you know, where are you going to work? How, you know, and all of these things tie into each other, health and wellness, um, social, uh, relationships. How are you going to get involved in community and continue to do the things that you love to do? Um, where, where you're going, if you're not sticking around where we are. Um, and so we built, uh, competencies that now are over a hundred that track, those seven different areas. And we're beginning to track freshmen as they come in and over the four years uh, so that we can both see where um, students are doing well and also have some feedback so that we know as a program how we can improve um, over time. Because if you're not measuring it, you're not really getting a good idea of what, you know, what's working and what's not. Uh, As part of those transition courses, we do have webinars uh, where we've pulled in the families. So looking at uh, everything from navigating benefits, um, you know, if you're on social security um, or, or not, uh, connecting them to um, other organizations upon graduation like Bobby Dodd uh, Industries or VR if they're not on VR. Um, and we've, we've done quite a few of those webinars to help keep parents informed and looking at what they might do. We also do have the students go home and um, ask their family questions about, well, where am I going to live? Because the student might think they're going to continue living in that $1,200 a month apartment, but the parents have said, hey, we're building an addition uh, onto the house or, you know, a a tiny house in the backyard, which, you know, that's a real example too. And if that conversation doesn't happen in advance, there could be problems along the way. Um, I will say that different families have different levels and expectations about how much information they want and how much involvement they want in that process. Uh, And we really do try to push the student to have involvement with the family. Um, But, you know, uh, our students are constantly growing and they may need a little more input from all sides uh, as they're exiting the program. But the the basic idea uh, behind having those classes was that we didn't want to just hand hand somebody a certificate as they exited the program and say, see you later. Uh, And so um, I do think that that is a differentiator you know, among programs is as something that we've worked a lot on and that we're trying to um, offer to our students and our families. And that, you know, uh, as uh, Preston mentioned, there's always room for improvement and we welcome that feedback and, you know, incorporate, incorporate that into each iteration of what we do as the years go by. And I'll add real quickly that we've only got 26 graduates at this point. So um, we're in our sixth year of having students. um, And, um, you know, we've built very quickly and modified very quickly. And we look at ourselves with an entrepreneurial spirit. Thank you so much, Ken, for um, sharing. We have, Let's see, about um, seven more minutes for some question and answer for our panel here. And I think there are some questions um, that Liz, if you wanna pull some of those questions out for our panel. One of them that just, um, that Barb just posed, which is, um, is about alumni activities. Do you have any alumni activities? And if so, who facilitates that? Uh, I'll see if I could jump on in there. All right. Honestly, that's been, now that Chase is done with the program, my passion is helping to grow the alumni. (laughs) And to give you an example, just this past weekend, we, now that things are 
starting to turn the corner from a pandemic perspective, we had another one of our Georgia Tech Excel tailgates um, and included both the alumni, the coaches, mentors, and the current students, as well as the parents. And we had over 100 people prior to the, um, the Georgia Tech Boston College game. So we are growing the alumni part of the program and looking for, um, for opportunities um, to pull the kids together. You know, we have Canvas and try to determine what are the kids looking for? And it started with social. You know, as kids transition back home or to wherever they're living, you know, they do want to, to see each other more often. So the plan is to pull together lots of opportunities. You know, even though we have the tailgate on Saturday, you know, Allison from the program pulled together like a, a virtual hangout Sunday where all the kids attended. So, you know, we're definitely looking to grow that, build out the program, and then expand it to other programs in the Atlanta area. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, yeah, if I could question. add just, oh, if I yeah, could add ahead. real quickly to that, I'll say that uh, Excel has a transition specialist that works uh, and does men's and women's groups um, with each cohort as they progress through their four years. And uh, we tasked her with doing focus groups separately with the students and the parents uh, of alumni uh, to get an idea into what they were looking for. Uh, we're finding that more and more students upon graduation are living together in apartments in the da uh, downtown uh, Atlanta area. And so, you know, just adding what Preston said, we're hoping that, that uh, those groups become both a network um, and a support group in, in terms of information and resources that will help both the students and the families uh, in anything, you know, it could be that there's a loss of a job, it could be um, a loss of a roommate, it could be, you know, just acting as resources for future alumni uh, as they come out of the program. Awesome, thank you. Um, let's see, another question. What is your approach to funding for the program and staff and paying mentors? And how about maintaining mentors? Yeah. Uh, so Go ahead, Luke. Luke. Oh, go. You can go ahead and Ken. Why don't you answer the first part, and I'll I'll answer the second part regarding mentors. You can answer the program. Sure, sure. So, um, you know, we're we're on our own dime in the program in terms of um, funding and staffing, uh, salaries, and all of that. So, uh, the university does provide space to us. Uh, and, you know, we may get resources like computers and, you know, things like that. But um, otherwise, uh, a lot of what we do is funded back through uh, the tuition dollars minus uh, student fees. It uh, also comes from grants, uh, gifts and donations. And we are building uh, an endowment, which we, you know, um, increase every year with the hopes of, uh, being able to provide scholarships for students uh, they might need it. We also have a significant number of students that are receiving tuition and maintenance, which is housing support from Georgia Vocational Rehab, although they phased that out. And so now uh, students are receiving pre-employment transition services uh, funding, which goes to the program, and then we give back to the student. Okay, thanks. And then yeah. Luke? And the yeah. way we kind of decide who we're going to pay as far as coaches are concerned to so the peers coaches that I was describing earlier get paid um, because that also so the students take their section of the peers class with each other and then there's a coaching class to it so they have that and then they have the other coaching roles that I was kind of describing earlier with the logistics and scheduling and all that, in addition to doing the peers. Um, role plays and different elements of that class. So it's just, that's the main thing that, that we pay. We also pay, like in the past, we've paid all coaches just because it does require an extra level of accountability, but just like 
I'm sure this is probably the case of a lot of y'all's institutions as well of just like the struggle with hiring within the bureaucracy and when you hire, need to hire like 40 people HR just kind of moves really really slow so it just made more sense you know and, and no one was really worried about it to just kind of pay the people that we really wanted you know a, a sufficient amount or you know a good amount of time of each week outside of um, you know, just the general expectations of being a mentor. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, here's another question uh, do, from Ryan. Um, do people, families use Medicaid um, uh, waiver dollars at all as a resource to support participating in Excel? And if so, how do they use waiver supports? Ken, do you want to grab that or do you want me to jump on in? Uh, go, yeah, go ahead if you have examples, okay. Preston, sure. Yeah, so as, as Chase embarked at Georgia Tech, we started the SSI disability process. Um, and it took about two and a half years. But as Ken had highlighted a little bit earlier, through Georgia Vocational Rehab, um, if you are approved for SSI disability, at least while Chase was in the program, they did provide support for tuition and, and housing and such. Things I understand have changed some, um, but yes, there is at least an op there was while Chase was in the program an opportunity to get support, which was very much appreciated. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question for Martha. Can you share your employment or job goal and how you're working on that goal? So um, I'm going to tell you, um, so if this is employment job goal, my main dream that I want to work up towards, I want to be a disability activist, a, dis a national disability activist in Washington, D.C., for disability rights, like that is my dream come true. I really want to be able to, uh, and how am I working on it? Things that I'm doing, like I'm taking um, sociology for one and psychology, and I'm also hoping to go into uh, the Georgia Lend program next year, which is a program at the State University for, what? Yeah, they were just congratulating you, Martha. Oh, oh yeah, they just are. Everyone's enjoying hearing from you. Oh, okay. So I was saying that Rand, um is a program that talks about leadership and policies for disability that I'm going to be uh, applying for for the fall of next year, which I'm really excited about and looking forward to expanding that in disability. And they also want to take maybe, um, I'm not, I don't really, but I, I was in um, next year, one of the classes that I am considering taking is gender studies, which um, let me understand both standards and maybe let me understand more about ethnicity and disability. And there was one more class I can't remember on the top of my head, but I will let you know if I uh, can remember, but I can't right now. That's what about okay. your internships right now, Martha? Aren't you oh, doing an so I interned now? at the Arc Georgia. It's okay. I interned at the Arc Georgia, which protects disability rights here in Georgia. Before I um, before I got into tech, I was doing that. But I was um, that's where I started my vlog Mondays with Martha, and was speaking with legislators about um, issues surrounding the disability community here in Georgia. And um, I was also um, on some uh, n featured in the news about COVID-19 and disability, about uh, the effects that it was being caused by and how we need to be doing better with um, health services due to that, due to that. And um, I also have, um, let's see, oh gosh, I've done a lot. Um, and now I'm um, this year in tech, I'm interning at the Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation, where I'm working on um, assistive technology policy for disability rights, which has really been 
a really fun experience. And um, I'm learning a lot more challenging skills, but they're really pushing me to uh, really get into information. And I'm really thankful for, for that. Oh my gosh, thank you for sharing all that. It's just so great to hear. Um, we're gonna go to some um, closing comments and a poll that has just launched. And then we'll have time hopefully afterwards if people can hang out for more questions. Yes, thank you, Martha, for um, ending our session with those very positive, encouraging, and inspiring words. And thank you all, the whole panel, for being here. It was just great to get all these multiple perspectives. We so appreciate you helping us in Minnesota to grow and expand inclusive post-secondary education options. And um, please hang around if you can. And and fill out the poll as it goes up. And if you can hang around, we will just have an informal discussion and maybe continue some of these slides that Luke had. Thank you so much, everyone.